Good morning, Liberate Church. Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, anybody excited that you were able to wake up this morning, that you were able to take yet another breath? Come on, if you are able, come on, let's just lift our hands up. Let's just tell the Lord how awesome he is, how wonderful he is. We thank you, Father, for your mercy, because it is by your mercies that we are not consumed. Father, we just thank you for another opportunity to be able to come into your presence, not without any restriction, without any inhibition, without any hesitation to exalt the great name of the Lord. You are a great king. You are a great God. Father, today we just lift you up and we magnify you. You said if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. And so we just posture ourselves. We position ourselves to lift you up. And we thank you, Father, for the harvest that is already coming in. We thank you, God, that today you are changing lives. We thank you, Father, that today there is reconciliation back to you. We thank you, God, that you are healing Father that you are saving souls, that you are renewing minds, that you are strengthening bodies. God, we thank you for your miracles, for your signs and your wonders. We shall see it. We shall see it. I thank you, God, that our eyes shall see, our ears shall hear, our mouth shall declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I thank you, Father, for your preserving power. I thank you, Father, for your keeping power. I thank you, Father, for your resurrecting power. I thank you, God, that that seed that was once dead is getting ready to come back alive. I thank you, God, for the well that was dry is getting ready to spring from rivers of living water. We thank you. We thank you. God, that you're going through every dry place. You're going through every dry place. You're going through every dry place. Let the water flow. Let the water flow. Let the water flow. Let the water of your spirit flow. Let the water of your spirit flow today, God. We thank you, God, that it's a never-ending flow. A never-ending flow in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody lift up your praise and give. Hey, come on, just release sound in this place. Flow, flow, flow. Hey, flow, flow, flow. Hey, flow, flow, flow. Hey, flow, flow, flow. River of peace. Flow, flow, flow. Come on, lift up your praise right here. Right here, we honor you in this place. We will extol the Lord. sing this morning. Hey, uh, give thanks. Hey, uh, give thanks. Hey, uh, for the Lord is good. Hey, uh, and he's always been good. Come on, lift it up. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Come on, for the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. Come on, and he's always been
and we'll praise your name. Hey, and, and we'll praise your name. Can we declare that and we'll praise? And we'll praise your name. Come on, declare and say, and we'll praise. And we'll praise your name. Hey, and we'll praise your name. And we'll praise your name.
always be good. Can we declare that last time? Give, give, give thanks. Give thanks. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. And He's always been good. Oh my God. And He's always been good. One more time. Give thanks. Give thanks. For the Lord. For the Lord is good. And He's always been. And He's always been. And he's always been good. And he's always been good. And he's always been good. Oh God. And he's always been good. Can we declare that? And he's always been good. And he's always been good. And he's always been good. Thank you, Lord. And he's always been good. 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 And he's always been. And he's always been good. You're gonna get it in a minute. And he's always been. Good. You won't get here. And he's always been. Good. And he's always been. Good. Enjoy it till it's gates with things. And he's always been. Good. And enjoy it's courts with praise. And he's always been. Good. Be thankful unto him. And he's always been. Bless his name. And he's always been. And he's always been. And he's always been. And he's always been good. And he's always been. And he's always been good. And he's always been.
and we say thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Woo. Hallelujah, God, we thank you, Father, for this moment. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, you've been so good. Woo! Hey! You've been, you've been so good. So good, so good. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Woo! We thank you for your faithfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Do we have any first-time visitors at this time? Amen. Are we all fit? Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, Lord. Thank you. You should have received a visitor's gift upon entering the church. We should have included a visitor card. Amen. If you did not receive that gift, please keep your hand lifted and a host will get one to you right now. Please deposit that completed visitor card in the offering receptacle during giving time so that we can personally welcome you on behalf of the Liberate Church family. We welcome you to the place of liberty. We pray that you have experienced already the love and the power of God through worship in the word, amen, that will be ministered to you personally on today, amen. Hallelujah. It is now time to worship God with our giving and the returning of the tithe and the sowing of our offerings, hallelujah. God, we thank you. There are several ways that you can give on this morning. You can give via social media, which all you have to do is go to our Facebook page and the donate button. You can also give via cash app, and that is dollar sign liberate church. You can also give via PayPal, which is paypal.me, amen, forward slash liberate church. Why are you are preparing your seed on this morning? We have a few announcements, amen, amen. We are super excited, hallelujah, about the reopening of Liberate Church. This whole series, if you have not caught the Misfit series this month, you still got one more Sunday to get it in and RSVP. We got one more Sunday left, but this whole series has been straight, mind-changing revelation I can't even put into words. We just know that we are peculiar and we are set apart and we accept it. We walk in it and amen, amen. Yes, Lord. We would also like to give a big thank you to everyone that came out on this week and for every donation made toward our second annual Thanksgiving Community Outreach. Amen. I also want to give a big shout out to our Hearts of Love Department as well as our hospitality department that spearheaded the event. Amen. We were able to bless over 70 families. Hallelujah. That is a blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes, Lord. There will be no Wednesday poor, I know y'all, on this week due to the Thanksgiving holiday, but please take this time to reflect on the faithfulness and the goodness of Christ. And you can always go back and watch a replay from Sunday Encounter or the Wednesday Night Pour before because there is plenty of word, amen, that you can gather on this Wednesday, amen, in the comfort of your home. So take this time and just be safe and spend it with your families, amen. Whether you are a DFW resident or you are located somewhere else in the world, there is a place for you right here at Liberate Church. Becoming a part of the online tribe, amen, or the local tribe is super easy. All you have to do from your desktop is head on over to our Facebook page and click Join Liberate, located in the menu on the left-hand side of the page. Or you can visit our website, which is www dot liberate dallas.com 
and click on the menu where it says membership. On the membership page, there is a button that says join Liberate. All you have to do is simply complete and submit the form Amen. The membership form and one of our elders or assistant pastors will be in contact with you to welcome you to the family. But let me be the first to say on this morning, welcome home. We welcome you home, family. Hallelujah. If you have made that decision on this morning, we welcome you. Do you have a prayer request on this morning? If so, please message us through our Facebook page and our frontline intercessors will pray for them individually and on their weekly prayer call. Also remember to stay up to date by following Liberate Church on both Instagram and Facebook at Liberate Dallas. Also remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you have not done so at Liberate Church Dallas. Are you guys ready to give on this morning? Hallelujah. You guys ready to give? I want you to begin to hold your mobile device in the air. Hold your seat in the air. Begin to repeat our confession of faith after me. I give unto God the best that I have. I return unto him that which is already his. I release what is in my hand as an exchange. Woo! For what God is releasing from heaven, I live by faith, therefore, God will cause me to live under an open heaven. Because of my obedience, my seed shall yield a bountiful harvest. My overflow will be unmatched, and my favor will never run out. In Jesus' name. I agree. Hallelujah. I agree. I agree. Hey, I agree. Hey, I agree. We agree with you, God. Hallelujah. Father, we begin to lift up our seed to you, Lord. We thank you, Father, that you are the God that fights for us, Lord. You are the God that carries us, oh God. You are the God that will never cause us to lack. You are the God that will cause us to prosper. Everywhere our feet go, everything that our hands touch, Lord, it will begin to prosper, Lord. So we thank you for your faithfulness, God. We thank you for being a gracious God. We thank you for your provision and your favor, Lord, that meets us at the door, God. We thank you for every promise, God. We will continue to stand on your word, Lord. We will continue to lean into you, Father. We will continue to trust you, oh God. In your holy, matchless name we pray. Amen. And we thank you, Father. We praise you in advance, oh God. Come on, let's begin to just worship the Lord. Hallelujah. God, we honor you in this place. Ooh, as we approach Thanksgiving, y'all, Thanksgiving is next week, and I know it's been crazy, and that's a time that we get to spend with family, and Lord, we can't even go spend it with family, because we're cautious of what's going on, but how many know that we should never stop praying? That we have to make our request known. And we just believe that God is going to heal our land. And we believe that even in, in on Thanksgiving, does anybody have anything to be thankful for, first of all? Listen, you're breathing. You woke up this morning. So God gave you the activities of your limbs. You're breathing again. You opened your eyes this morning. That right there alone is something to be thankful for. Hallelujah. He's kept your family. He's kept your mind. He's healed your body. That's something to be thankful. He's provided for you. That's something to be thankful for. Uh, so can we just begin to thank the Lord right where you are? Come on, begin to just thank him for everything that he's been doing in your life. Everything that he's going to do, even in this pandemic, what he's going to do. He's been doing it, y'all. I don't know about you. He's been doing it, y'all. So can we just begin to just thank him for his goodness? Come on, thank you for his gratefulness. Come on, thank you for his faithfulness. God, you've been faithful. Come on, even when we're not faithful, God, you've been faithful. And we thank you, Lord. And we thank you. Hallelujah. As we just worship him, I was just going to lift up an old song that y'all probably heard back in the day, but we're going to sing it this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Come on, if you really have a thankful heart and everything that he's doing, can we just fill this room with thankfulness and gratefulness? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on. He wants to hear you this morning. Come on, the blessings upon you, God. has grace us with the blessing. Hallelujah. Come on, let's fill this room with gratefulness. Mm, I said the Lord bless you. worship the Lord in this place. Come on, hallelujah. Come on, just worship him in this place. Oh, come on, let's sing that again. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. And keep you. And keep you. Make his face shine upon. Be great. Be gracious. The Lord. The Lord turn Come on and give you and give you peace. We sing Amen. And it is so. Amen. Amen. Come on, the blessings of the Lord are yesterday. around you and within you 
He is with you. He is with you. In the evening. And you're coming. And you're going. And you're weeping. And rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. Can we sing that? Amen. May his bread go before you. Go before and behind you. And behind and beside you. And beside all around you. All around and within you. He's with you. He is with, he is with you. He is with in the morning, in the, morning, in the evening, in, the evening, in your coming, in, the in your going, in, the in your weeping. He is for you. 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 Come on, we get to work. Come on. One more time, one more time, one more time, one more time. Your presence, your presence is heaven to me. To me, it's nothing like your presence. Nothing like your presence. Your presence. Your presence is heaven to me. This peace in his presence. Can you just begin to thank him in this place? Every time we talk about gratitude, I think about Jesus healing the ten lepers. And I've taught this many times before. But the Bible says how there was only one that came back to say thank you. And one of the things that I'm always teaching is the power of gratitude. Because the Bible says that when he healed the lepers, he removed their leprosy. He told them that as they, as they walked off, he said, show yourself to the physician. Their leprosy was gone. The sign of leprosy was gone. But when the one came back, he said... You've now been made whole. And one of the things that I teach is that 
See, you can have a disease removed, but you can still have the residue of when it was there. God can heal some things in your life. He can deliver you from some things, but you still deal with the effects of having lived with leprosy. Because I don't know if you understand leprosy, that it actually damages your organs and it da damages your, your immune system. And though the signs of leprosy had been removed, they still had to deal with the consequences of having lived with leprosy. But the one who came back to say thank you, he said, I've made you whole. And when he said, I made you whole, that means he made him to a place to where it reversed all of the effects of the leprosy as if he had never had it before. When you have gratitude, it doesn't just heal you, but it brings a wholeness to your life that then begins not only to remove the issues, but remove the, the residue of the issues. When you have postured yourself to be thankful and to recognize what God has done. See, many of us just want the, to be delivered from a thing. Many of us just want this issue to leave, but we forget that you still got to rebuild after the issue leaves. But a heart of gratitude will put me in a position as if it never happened before. There will be no sign of your struggle. There will be no sign of your brokenness. There will be no sign of your dysfunctional family. There will be no sign that you battled addiction. There will be no sign that you had dealt with molestation. I'm looking, I don't just want to heal it. I want wholeness. When you look at me, I don't want you to be able to know that I even went through what I went through because my heart is filled with gratitude. God, I thank you for what you delivered me out of. There are many who say, you know, I don't celebrate Thanksgiving because, you know, I'm with, I'm not with all, you know, the whole story of the pilgrims and Native Americans completely understand that. But I don't have any problem with any day that's set aside for me to recognize, to be intentional about, to be observant of what God has done. I'm not celebrating no pilgrims, but I'm celebrating make it a God holiday <laughs> a day for me to be intentional <laughs> especially in a day like 2020 it's a day for me to be intentional and think about the miraculous God I serve that regardless of what has happened this year he is still moving he is still working miracles he's still blowing my mind he's still the God of exceeding and abundantly he's still a God who will do more than I ever He's still that God. In a pandemic, he's still that God. As a matter of fact, in the pandemic, he shines brighter. His grace is shown before all men. His glory is seen brighter. It is in darkness that his glory shines the brightest. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you, God. We're intentional about it. Like the one who walked off and came back. Like the one who, as he started walking, started seeing his skin clear up and said, oh my God, he really did what he said. Let me go back. How many of you had a moment where you prayed and you began to walk and you say, my God, he did what he said. My God is starting to manifest everything God When you begin to see his hand, to not keep walking. <laughs> I dare somebody, when his word starts to manifest, that you don't just keep going about your business, that you don't just keep walking, but that you stop and say, hold up, let me turn around and say thank you. He's a God of his word. And when I see it start to manifest,
manifest. I can't just live life as usual. I, I can't just keep going about my destination. I can't just keep walking. But as I see it start to manifest, there ought to be something that stops you in your tracks. There ought to be something that makes you paralyzed. Turn around and thank him and worship him and bless him for all that he's done, for who he is, for being faithful. just gotta stop <laughs> and say thank you I just gotta stop and say thank you thank you Lord thank you for keeping me father thank you for keeping me this year thank you for keeping me in my right mind thank you for preserving my body thank you for providing some of you have been without a job but look at God still providing some of you have been diagnosed with COVID you still here. Some of you have lost more than you gained, but you ain't lost your mind. I need somebody in here to begin to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I just want to say, oh, thank you, Jesus. God. Oh, he's worthy of the praise. He's worthy of the praise. He's worthy of the praise. Oh, he's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Some of you are getting free right now just in your thank you. Some of you are getting that breakthrough you need because of that gratitude. Some of you are getting free and healed right now. You're getting free and healed right now because you're saying thank you. God, God, we thank you. Oh, Father, you're amazing. There's no one like you, God. You're an amazing God. You're a good Father. You're a sovereign Lord. We exalt you. Oh, we exalt you. We acknowledge there is no one like you who can stand beside the Lord God Almighty. You are the King of Kings and you are the Lord of Lords. So we thank you, God. Thank you, we God. bless your name. We blow kisses to you. We love on you, Lord. 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 We love you, we love you. We love you, we love you. We love you. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus. Oh, you're worthy. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus.
Father, we pray that you be pleased with our worship, with our praise, with our adoration. We pray, Lord God, that this, this fragrance is pleasing to you. Lord, that you would come and rest here. We invite you into our space. We invite you into our space and we invite you into our lives and we invite you into our plans for we are nothing without you. So Father, be glorified on today. Be glorified on today. Be glorified on today. Oh, be glorified, be glorified. Be glorified on today. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. Now as your word comes forth, Father, let it come forth with power. That it may set the captives free, Lord. That it may open spiritually blinded eyes. Prepare our hearts to receive your word. Father, because we don't want to just be hearers, but we want to be doers. So, Father, let this word take root and let it bear fruit in our lives. We thank you, God, that you've called us out. We thank you that you've set us apart, that you've made us misfits in this world's culture, that your hand is upon us and empowered us to do great things for your glory. So we declare, Lord God, that every chain, everything that is hindering us and keeping us from doing those things, from walking in our purpose, Lord God, that we freed on today so that we can operate in obedience to your will and your way. Ooh. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah and amen. Just give them a praise as you take your seats. Oh, oh my goodness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Y'all yeah. about to make my wig come off up in here. Trying to hold it together. Hallelujah. Woo. Thank you. Hey, ya rabba se kandere da bose. Be glorified. Be glorified. We thank. Hey. Chill, 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 
Hallelujah. God is pleased. God is pleased. He's pleased. He's pleased. He's pleased. Sometimes you just need a good old praise break. Because that praise is going to introduce your second win. You don't know what some of the people in here have endured. What God has done, what he's brought them through, and what he's doing in their life. So if you ain't got nothing to praise him for, just celebrate your neighbor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if you got birth in your body, you always got something to praise him for. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's get into this word. I've trimmed my word down tremendously. So we're going to blow through this thing. We're going to blow through this thing. Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Y'all done made me break a sweat before I even started preaching. <laughs> Listen, how I start my message with after preaching here. Lord, help. I don't even want to know how frizzy I'm looking right now. Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10. After you get there, let's do our sermon faith confession. Repeat after me. The word of God is incorruptible seed. The word of God abides forever. So I choose to stand on his word. And to believe what it says about me. I exchange fear with faith, and I decree that I am liberated, I am victorious, and I am healed. God has given me, I need you to tell that to the enemy in your mind, God has given me a future and a hope, and it shall come to pass. I need you to say that with some authority and it shall come to pass in Jesus name amen and it is so I heard my spiritual grandbaby they recorded her Myla saying this and it, it stunned me how much authority she said and it shall come to pass I'm like Lord she four and she said with more authority than some adults some of us don't believe that what God said is going to come to pass so, so you saying it real timid but anybody who knows that he is faithful to his word you can say it with some authority even if it don't look like it I know that he said it and it shall come to pass no devil in hell can stop it. Hallelujah. All right, let's read Ephesians 2.10. I'm reading from the Amplified Classic Edition. Don't you start, Malik. Don't you start, sir. Listen, I'm tired. I can't. I ain't got no more. I ain't got no more. I need to reserve the rest for this message. <laughs> I'm out of shape, y'all. Lamika working with me. Hold on now. Don't judge me. <laughs> Thank you, babe. Ephesians 2.10 for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned for beforehand for us, taking paths which he had prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Lord, bless this word and bless those who hear it in Jesus' name. Okay, so we are coming towards the end of this series, Tribe of Misfits. Uh, many, when they first heard this title, were thrown off. They're like, I ain't no misfit. But now we taught this and many of you are like, I'm a misfit. So praise the Lord, your language has changed. <laughs> but uh, we talk a lot about purpose in this church. We talk a lot about God creating us for a purpose, to fulfill a purpose, to walk out a specific calling that he is assigned to our lives. Um, but what happens when you feel you're walking in your purpose and things still aren't working out? And that's where many, I've seen many people be in that position where they feel like they know what God has called them to do and they're doing that, but it doesn't seem like things are panning out the way that they desire for them to pan out. And oftentimes this is caused because we compromise who we are. 
So it's not just enough for you to know purpose and say, okay, I'm going to fulfill purpose. But now we have to execute purpose according to the way that he has called for us to execute it. And so many times we'll say, okay, God, I'm going to give you my yes. I'm going to do what you call me to do. But then once we get in the path of purpose, now we want to do it our way. And so today I'm teaching from a message entitled Purpose Sabotage. Purpose Sabotage. Um, I'm not the only one who's probably felt unworthy of the assignment on my life. Uh, unworthy of the calling, um, ill-equipped, and, 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 you know, just... I, I felt at one point that my purpose was too big for me. And I was like, God, are you sure you chose right? Are you sure you meant me? Maybe you were pointing to the person behind me. Maybe the person beside me. Maybe I thought you were looking at me, but you were looking at them right there. Because you didn't feel that you were enough for what God had called you to do. If you've ever felt that way, I want you to know that's how you know you're in purpose. If you've ever been called to do something and you like, I got this, that's not God, okay? If you can figure out how to do it yourself, if you feel like you can do it yourself, if you feel like it's not intimidating or too big for you, that is not God. God always designs purpose to leave room for him. And so <clears throat> when we look at this scripture Ephesians chapter 2 one of the things that this scripture does is this proof that there is a destiny for my life because I know some people are like well destiny people always talk about destiny they trying to sound all deep there's a destiny you need to walk into your destiny and all of this and they think this is a you know something a cliche word that we use when we're trying to be super spiritual but the truth of the matter is that there is a destiny for your life. This destiny is something that you have been purposed or destined to do. A dest something that you've been destined to do means that you have been uh, set apart for a specific purpose or place. And we discussed this when I taught in uh, Jeremiah and Wednesday poor. We talked about God setting you apart. And, and that's pretty much a destiny. I have been preserved and set apart. And there has been a plan that has been devised specifically for me and for me to fulfill it. Okay. And so this scripture says that we are God's workmanship. And that we are born new in Christ Jesus so that we can now walk in those things that God had already prepared or destined for us to walk in. So that means that before the foundations of the earth, God had already created a path for each of us that we would walk in it. But the only way we can walk in it is if we're made new in Christ. So if you're not made new in Christ, you cannot see this path that God created for you because it's a spiritual path. And many of us try to find this path the natural way. And we become frustrated. We can't understand why we don't know what we're supposed to do because God says, I had already arranged this in the spiritual realm and you can only tap into it through the realm of the spirit, which means that you have to be born again through Christ and receive the Holy Spirit so that you can be awakened to the path that was created before for you. Okay. And so this is very clear for us that there is a path. But for many of us, we began walking on that path and things fall apart. And we're like, what is going on, God? Where are you? How come you're not here? How come I felt you here before and now I don't feel you here? How come I felt like I knew what I was doing and now I don't know what I'm doing? I felt like I was going the right way and now I'm not really so sure. Because we begin on a path doing like we all do. I love you, Jesus. Save me. I promise, Lord, you save me from this. I will give my life to you. And if you just take and get me out of this one, I promise, Lord, I'm going to be obedient to you. Or either we at the altar and we feel the power of God. We're like, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. And we're like, okay, you're saved. We're like, hallelujah. And we enter into this soul, you know, 
you know, vulnerable and obedient and we're in awe of God and we're on fire and we want to do his will. We're like, yes, this is amazing. My life is amazing now and all of this. And then we start looking around. What other people doing? Man, look at them, man. They got promoted over there. And man, that's awesome. And oh, man, they got this new car. And oh, man, they married. And oh, they having some kids. Oh, they got their house. And we get distracted, you know. We get distracted of all the stuff that's going on. And we're like, man, God, okay. I gave my life to you. Like, when am I going to get that stuff? I feel like right now I'm sacrificing everything. I'm losing everything. And, and when you're in the beginning of your faith, it's all great till God starts cutting you. It's all great till God starts pruning you. It's all great till God starts telling you no. It's all great till God starts slowing you down. It's all great till God starts to put you in the fire and refine you. Because, see, the Bible says whenever he sees fruit, he prunes it. And so when we start growing, then we go into the pruning process. But because we're growing, we feel like that's punishment. And we feel like we shouldn't have to be pruned because I'm growing. I'm doing what you want me to do. So why am I losing everything? And God's saying, you got to twist it. You're losing things because you are growing. And when you grow, I got to make room for your growth. But see, our religious mind says that if I'm doing what I think is right and what's pleasing to God, that things are, should be doing going well for me. I shouldn't have to sacrifice anything. I shouldn't be getting pruned and cut and losing things. I should be gaining things, right? Because we're looking at it from a natural perspective. If I'm getting better and I'm obeying God, my natural situation should be better. But God's saying, I'm not focused on your natural situation. I really couldn't care less about that. I'm thinking about your spiritual situation. But we look at our natural situation, and so it feels like we're losing and everyone else is winning. The people who are doing wrong are winning. The ones who don't go to church, they're winning. The ones who ain't reading their word, they're winning. The ones who are lying and cutting people and double-crossing people are winning. And I'm doing what's right, and I'm losing. We get distracted on that path. You know, we start going on this path and really intending to do what God wants us to do. And it is not looking like I want it to look. And so now, since it's not looking like I want it to look, I think I need to take the reins again, God. I think I, think I, need, I need to take control again. I take this wheel because you, you, you lead me down the path of, to nowhere, to nothingsville. And I'm going to take this wheel and I'm going to somethingsville because everybody else got something over there. So now we take the wheel back from God. We were walking in our purpose and in obedience, and we take the wheel back from God because we want stuff, right? We want to look like we're doing something. I told everybody I got saved. This ain't how saved people are supposed to look. I should not be struggling. So I'm going to make me look like I want to look. So I can prove to these people that made fun of me for getting saved that being saved is good. So I'm going to do it myself. And he says, I've created good works, preordained, predestined, before the foundation of the earth. I have this path laid out for you. And what is in this path? Not only are there the good works, but in the path of purpose, in the path of obedience, there is provision, there is protection, there is grace, there is wisdom. But we don't know that. We're taking our own path so we can get what we want. And so we're confused. Why is it? Why is this thing being so difficult? Why am I not looking like I expected to look? And it's because we forgot we were misfits. We went from beginning this path of being separated, of being called out to now. Now I want to conform to everybody else because that is where the stuff is. That is where the acceptance is. That is where all the physical and natural things I want are. They're in that path, not in the misfit path, God. So then we start to pervert our purpose so that it can fit and work with me doing what I feel <clears throat> God has called me to do, but not doing it the way he called me to do it. Because you do know there's a way. That's why the Bible said there's a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it's ruined. But there is a way that God has for us that may not seem right. But in the end, there's prosperity. 
But see, we want to walk in purpose our way. And let me explain to you how that looks. Walking in purpose our way means that maybe if you're a, a singer, a psalmist, a musician, God has given you a specific sound and calling and style, but you see people who have this sound, this calling, and this style prospering. And so God said, no, you're set apart. You're supposed to go this way and sound this way and do things this way. And you're like, but they are getting the gigs and they are getting the money and they are getting the fame and they are getting a promotion. So I know I'm purpose to do this, but I'm going to do it that way. Because that way seems like the successful way. <clears throat> but this is the thing about God. And this is the thing why it's so important to obey God in the way that he's called you to. Because he knows what's coming. Yeah. He knows what's next. Right. He knows the move that's about to come. And see, many of you who should be ahead of a thing and the behind a thing because you try to go and do what everybody else is doing because that's popping. When God was trying to get you to be a trailblazer and do it before it was popping, he says he wants you to begin to create a move versus jump on the end of a move. But see, when you're chasing what seems like success, you go with the crowd. <clears throat> Y'all know Toby Nwigwe, who, who sings Try Jesus. So he got this song that my husband and I love, Eat. He and his wife rap on this. And she said, we don't ride the waves, we create them. That's my favorite line of the song. Because to me, as the body of Christ, and as prophetic people, God makes you privy to what he's about to do. But because we don't have confidence in his voice and his instruction, he will show you a thing and you won't do it till you see someone else do it. So you end up riding waves you should be creating in your business, in your career, in your music, in your ministry. God has called you to do things that haven't been done yet, but because you want to rush to success and you don't have confidence in what God has set you apart to do, you always end up being a bandwagon rider instead of a driver. My, my, my. And so... Many times we sabotage purpose because we feel like what God has called us to do is just too different. It's too different. Nobody's going to get me. I've heard people say this so much. Man, I'm just so different. I don't think anybody's going to get me. I don't think anybody's going to understand my style. I don't think anybody is going to understand my language. I don't think anybody is going to understand what I do. People who are called to you will understand. Because they will have the same need uh, that you have to contribute. They will be looking for what it is that you have in you. But the problem is you keep sounding like everyone else. So the definition of sabotage is to destroy or damage something deliberately so that it does not work correctly. There are many reasons why we sabotage. Some of the top reasons that psychiatrists believe we sabotage is first faulty thinking we overvalue the things we know and undervalue the things that are unfamiliar -wee. lord have mercy that's a word for somebody because that's what you're doing in your life you are under you are overvaluing the things that you know and undervaluing the things that you don't know that are unfamiliar. This is the thing. The stuff that you have that look like everybody else, you think is great. The parts of you that's different, you think it's trash. Wow, wow, wow. My God. See, because you thought that it was the popular part of you that was going to set you apart. Now, isn't that a contradiction? You thought the common part of you would set you apart. Wow. Think about that. We're set apart because there's something different. You're trying to be set apart in your likeness. And you are undervaluing the part of you that is truly set apart. 
the part of you that is truly different, you think it's trash and you're ashamed of it. So you sabotage your purpose because you think God can't use that part of you. But you forgot God gave you that part. God gave you your uniqueness and you are putting it in the dumpster and overlooking it and you're wondering why no one sees you and they don't see you because you blend in. Yeah. Yeah. And have you ever noticed the people that we admire the most are the ones who are the most different? Yeah. But yet we don't see ourselves that way? Right. Some of the, our favorite celebrities, favorite singers, favorite actors, favorite, you know, athletes. They're popular because of their quirks, but we don't embrace our own. So you overvalue the things that you know and undervalue the things that are unfamiliar. Another reason we self-sabotage is fear of intimacy or fear of rejection. Hmm. I've been there. Lord, have mercy. Has God ever given you a vision to do something and it just seems so different, so off the wall, you're afraid that people will reject it. And so you begin to intentionally uh, destroy your plans by procrastination or, or, or by saying, I don't have clarity. I don't know. I just don't know what exactly God wants me to do. Yeah. <laughs> I've given that speech. I just need to hear God a little longer. Wow. You've been praying about this for five years. How much longer you need? Somebody ain't listening because God is surely talking. How much clarity do you need? Like you are literally waiting for Gabriel to deliver you a hand-given letter. You know, you want some kind of supernatural encounter. And God says, you're sabotaging this. You're purposefully hurting this because you're afraid that people won't like it. And I tell people this all the time. When we're afraid to present a gift, it's because we've made our gift our identity. This is why I talked about my broadcast a few weeks ago. What is your relationship with your gift? Because if your gift, it, it makes up who you are, you are always afraid of people rejecting it. Because if they don't like your gift, they don't like you. But your gift is meant to be a vehicle to purpose, not your purpose. Your gift brings you to purpose. It isn't your purpose. And so now you can never get into purpose because you won't even step into the car because you're afraid that people are going to reject the car. So you never even get in the car. Because everybody been telling you how gifted you are. Yeah. Everybody been telling, oh, you're just so gifted. Yeah. You're such a good gift. You're a gifted artist. You're a gifted musician. You're a gifted singer. You're a gifted preacher. Yeah. You're so gifted. You're so gifted. You're so gifted. And then you're just like, this is me. This is who I am. I'm a musician. I'm a preacher. I'm a singer. I'm a, you know, this has now become you. Yeah. But last time I checked, you were a vessel. That's yeah. what you are. You have the privilege of using these gifts. Right. It's not who you are. This is why when people do a thing and then they become injured and they can never do it again, they go into a depression, they want to die because all they know about themselves is that they are a good singer or football player or, you know, musician or artist or doctor, whatever. Because we don't realize our true purpose is to be used by God. However he wants to use us, however long he wants to use us. Yeah. Yeah. We have put all of our purpose in our gift. And now you unhappy. Now you mad. But the problem is when I put too much value in my gift, I'm afraid of rejection. So I sabotage myself. This is why we got so many gifted people that never reach full potential. And then... There is procrastination and avoidance. Not dealing with problems until they get so big you're forced to deal with them. So we will sabotage a situation because we're trying to avoid the complications or the difficulties or the challenges that are going to come with it. And then we don't ever want to deal with it until it's right in our face and we have to deal with it. So we let things get so big. I just want to put it off. I'm just going to put it off. I'm just going to put it off. This big issue... With me, I'm, I'm, y'all know I'm transparent. I don't care. <laughs> Judge me. I don't care. 
One of my biggest issues was when I'm doing something that God called me to do, I just want to do the parts I like. Yeah. <laughs> I procrastinate on the parts I don't like. I avoid the things I don't like. <laughs> but then you get to a point where you have no choice in order for you to move this thing forward. You got to do the part you don't like. And most of the times the part you don't like is the part you're insecure about. Man. It's the part you're insecure about that you don't feel like you're equipped well enough for. You know, so I'm just going to do the stuff I feel good doing and I know I'm good at. I'm going to spend all day, all night doing that. Right. Never get to the end of it because I'm still pushing off the stuff that makes me insecure. Still pushing off stuff I feel like I'm, I'm not good enough for. And then, but the thing is, you need all of it That's right. for purpose. You need all of it. You need the good, the bad, the ugly, the stuff that you feel happy about and confident in, the stuff you feel insecure about, the stuff that scares you. That's right. You need it. And so we never walk into purpose. We begin, or either we pervert our purpose because we're trying to avoid the stuff that makes us uncomfortable. We're trying to avoid the stuff that we don't like. Why do we do that? Dang, I got 10 minutes left, y'all, and I'm only like in the first little bit of this message. So let me hurry up. All y'all shouting used up my time. So we do this because of self-image. Turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel, chapter 9. 1 Samuel, chapter 9. Okay. In 1 Samuel, you know that Samuel was told by God to uh, anoint Saul as the king. Okay, the people of Israel crying out, they want a king, they want a king. So God showed him that he was going to meet a young man, and that was going to be the king. Okay? And so uh, Samuel, Saul is looking for Samuel because he lost uh, his father's donkeys. And they're looking for him, and, and his assistant, his um, servant said, let's go see the seer. He can tell us what, what's going on and which direction to go. And so as soon as he gets to Samuel, Samuel uh, tells him he wants him to come eat dinner with him. And then Saul answered in verse 21 of chapter 9 of 1 Samuel. He says, am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Why then do you speak like this to me? Yeah. Now, if, if the seer invited me to dinner, yeah. I would be like, man, that's awesome. <laughs> I was looking for him anyway. Right. Now I get to eat dinner with him. Right. But Saul was almost offended that he invited him to dinner because he thought of himself so small. He said, why do you speak like this to me? I am the least of the least. He says, I am of the smallest tribe of Israel, and my family is the least of those families. I am the lowest of the low. I am the least of the least. Do you understand when somebody sees themselves as small, you can do something for them that's kind, and they, they still can't even appreciate it? How many of you have, have been offended by opportunities because you saw yourself so small? It's supposed to be a blessing and a privilege, but you're like offended because you almost feel like they're setting you up to fail. Wow. So he saw himself so small, and this perspective, this self-image haunted him throughout his assignment. It haunted him. So much so. That when Samuel was about to acknowledge him as king and announce him as king before the children of Israel, this dude was hiding. Yeah. Flip over to chapter 10. And verse 20 says, And Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near. The tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of uh, Matri was chosen. And Saul and, his, and the son of Kish was chosen. When he, uh, but when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore, they inquired of the Lord. You know how good he was hiding. They had to ask God. God, where is this man? We done looked high and low. He big. How you get that? 
you that's some good hiding. The Bible says he was so tall, he was literally head and shoulders above everybody else. How do you hide that well? Lord, show me, reveal in Jesus' name. Move the tree. And then it says, has the man come here yet? And the Lord answered, there he is hidden among the equipment. <laughs> God ratted him out. <laughs> he behind that arm over there. Did you see Saul big old behind, hunchback behind? Dude, really? Get your big self out here. Right. I mean, geez. So he's hiding. Some of us are doing that spiritually. I mean, you big in the spirit trying to hide. My God, that's a word for somebody. Big in the spirit. Everybody sees you. I used to laugh because I said, God, had, he's funny. Because every time I would try to hide my calling, something would happen and people would always spot me out. Like I would always seem to reveal myself. You know, not intentionally, but it was like when God has placed something in you, he will put you in an environment that brings it out of you. It could be good or bad environment. I would be put in bad environments. <laughs> And the prophet in me would just be just like, I'd be over here looking strange, just tortured. I'm like, really, God? Really? I mean, just, oh, Lord, it's demons. Oh, oh, God, oh, oh, no. Now, you know, Holy Ghost here. I'm itchy. Oh, it was torture. I'd be in dry environments. God be telling me stuff, showing me stuff. And it was just like, and then people would see it on me. Or I'd just say one little thing. I'm like, I ain't going to say nothing to nobody. And somebody would, would come to me and they'd be like, can you pray for me? I'm like, mm-mm. Nope. I don't pray. <laughs> I can't pray without prophesying to people. And then I pray, and then they always had that same expression. They like always in the middle prayer look up at me like, what in the world? I'm like, jeez, man. And that's what God was doing though. He was calling me out. He was revealing me. You can't hide from your call. People of God. You reveal yourself. You tell on yourself when you're not even trying to. You call yourself trying to rebel and you still end up being called out. I think about my husband. I laugh about that. He's my husband on his job, y'all. <laughs> you mind if I tell him your testimony? <laughs> so my husband, <laughs> you know, his goal is to eventually be full-time ministry. Y'all know he worked in construction. Very demanding job. So he was like, I don't want to get promoted at this company because it's going to be too much responsibility. I want to be able to focus more on the church. So he was purposefully trying to sabotage himself so he wouldn't get promoted. Who does that? First off, who tried not to get promoted? Jesus. <laughs> not my will, but thine will. But yeah, whatever. <laughs> and so he tried not to like he, my husband works really fast. He's amazing at his job. He's a hard worker. He doesn't know how to not work hard. And so things that take projects that take Several people, several weeks, he could do by himself in a few days. And he think sabotaging himself means maybe taking more, few, more than two days, maybe a week, maybe four days. That's still faster than everybody else. And his boss come to him and says, I really need you for this position. I've been promoted. I want you to pull, come into my position. I can tell that you have not been doing all you can do. The boss still knew he was sabotaging it. Because everywhere he goes, he tells his managers, I'm a pastor. He wants them to know up front, you know, there are going to be days where I'm not working overtime because I have to go to church. They respect it. They honor it. And so they knew that he was not wanting more responsibility so he could be able to be a good pastor. And, and they were like, but we really need you. We know. I see it. And this is what many of you do. Like in the spiritual realm, y'all try to do the least. Y'all try to do the least. Y'all be like, I'm not going to pray hard 
I'm not going to use my gifts because I don't want to say yes to God. Uh Uh-huh, I'm looking at some of you. Don't be trying to look away. I see you. And y'all be trying not, and we just like Apostle Boss. I know you ain't trying your hardest. Because God showed me where you are. I pray. He showed me where you are. You hiding, but I see you. But see, we're not those type of pastors, you know, just throw you in the stuff. We, we, you know, we lovingly push you along. We not that type of church, y'all. I done visited a church. They tried to make us youth pastor when the first time we visit. We ain't joined. We was youth pastors. What? <laughs> Praise the Lord that God sent us youth pastors. We're like, what in the world? You don't even know my name. But <laughs> so Saul was trying to sabotage himself. He hid himself because of his self-image. Some of you are hiding now because of the way you see yourself. He said, I'm the least of the least. How can I be king? And you're saying, God, I made so many mistakes. God, I can't, I'm not the best speaker. God, I'm not the smartest. How can I be that? And he's saying, because I'm going to do it. You're a vessel. You're trying to put all of your weight into your gifts and what, to you, what you can do. Why? Because you only value the stuff that's familiar. You're not valuing the stuff that's unfamiliar. And then insecurity can lead to prematurity. Turn to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13. Whenever you see yourself as small, you develop the little man complex. Y'all know what the little man complex is. Don't act like you don't know. The ones that always trying to act like they big and bad because they feel small. They may be physically small, but some of them are like you average height. Right. <laughs> you still trying to act like you bigger. You know, so you got to prove yourself. You barking and all. Uh, uh, and you're trying to gain the approval of people and the respect of people. So in 1 Samuel chapter 13, Saul was fighting the Philistines. And he was given instruction by Samuel. Verse 7 says, And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal. And all the people followed him trembling. They were scared. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, then Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I might not have made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Verse 13 says, and Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord, your God, which he commanded you. For now, the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Saul in his insecurities, because once again, seeing himself as the lowest of the low, the least of the least, he became insecure in what God told him and God's word. God told him, wait for Samuel. You do not have the authority to make this sacrifice. But because you're so afraid and you're so insecure, you jump ahead and do something prematurely that you are not authorized to do. Many times we do this. We jump into stuff we have not been authorized, ordained, and graced to do because we are insecure with who God has called us to be. That makes us insecure in God's word. And so now we feel like we need to step ahead of God. 
But the problem is whenever you're dealing with prematurity, you also risk the loss of your legacy. His premature move costs him legacy. How many of us are moving into something too soon that God had already set up and ordained to extend for generations, but now you have ended it prematurely because you didn't have security in what God said and who he called you to be. He said, I had assigned your name to be able to reach for generations. And this moment now, I'm already choosing someone else to give that to. This moment, he chose David. This moment. Not the next chapter. Not in 15. In this moment, he chose David. My God. He did something out of his insecurity that caused him to act in panic instead of obedience. Some of us live our life responding in panic instead of obedience. Everything you do is an impulse. It's a knee-jerk response because you don't feel confident that God's hand is really upon you and that he will do what he says. So you constantly make a knee-jerk decisions and then having to clean up the mess afterwards. He said, I told you to do X, Y, and Z. As soon as he finished this thing, here comes Samuel. All he had to do was wait a little bit longer. He got antsy. No, no, no. I'm going ahead and do it. And it cost him legacy. That premature move killed the baby. My last point, and I'm, well, actually it was my second to last, but it's going to be last. So now flip over to 15. Now flip over to 15. This is when we know when Saul was um, fighting the Amalekites and God told him to utterly destroy everything, everything, everything. What is outside of everything? Nothing. He said everything. But of course, Saul didn't do that because Saul doing Saul. He in purpose, but he doing purpose his way, right? He's doing what he was created and called to do, but he's not doing it the way God created and called him to do it. See, this is where we sabotage, compromise purpose, and we wonder why our purpose isn't fruitful. We start questioning if it is purpose. Maybe this isn't what I'm supposed to do. Oh, it is. You're just not supposed to do it that way. And so Saul, uh, he did not follow all the instructions. He kept the, the choice animals the choice animals and the bible says that god told samuel in verse 12 it says so samuel rose early in the morning to meet saul and it was told to samuel saying saul went to carmel and indeed he has set up a monument for himself and has gone on around passed by and gone down to gilgal now this dude you he used to being disobedient this Fool, yes, I'm going to call him a fool because he acting like one. He's being foolish. He didn't disobey God and then made a monument. Small man syndrome. Still trying to prove himself. So he made a monument of himself instead of obeying God his priority was making himself look good not obeying God he was in rebellion but wanted to have a monument how many things in our life have we erected so that we look successful while remaining in our disobedience how many things have we gotten to be a monument? Look at, look at this. Look at my, my, my ride. Look at my clothes. Look at what I've been able to build in my disobedience. Priorities all out of whack. I just want to seem big because in my eyes, I feel small. So I need you to see me high and lifted up. And so... He built a monument for himself, and then he comes up, and he sees Samuel coming, and he says, Blessed are you, 
of the Lord. I have performed my commandment to the Lord. And then Samuel says, well, what is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? He, and he's like, well, we got that from the, you know, uh, Amalekites because we wanted to give an offering to the Lord. And Samuel said, be quiet. <laughs> I will tell you what the Lord says to me last night. And he said, speak on. Or the other translations say, say on. I like that. It sounds real. Say on, my brother. Sounds real, you know, deep or whatever. But um, he says, speak on. And then so Samuel said, <laughs> verse 17, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? He called him on it. You were little in your own eyes. So little, you were trembling behind the equipment. I remember you. Don't be trying to act like big shot to me. Don't be calling blessings to me as I walk up like I don't know what you did. I remember you when you were nobody coming up to see me and you were telling me that you were the least of the least. But didn't God make you the king? Have you ever had somebody try to talk to you like you didn't know them before? Preach, I'm, I'm proud of your success, but don't try to get fly with me. He like, I, I'm the one that anointed you, bro. And you would run back like Big Shot. It's your little monument and whatnot. You know what they say about people who need big monuments? I'm just saying. And so when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did the, not the Lord anoint you over Israel? And now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fight against them until, you are, until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And now when he gets called out, he says, but I've obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord has sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Yeah. He's like, but the people took the plunder, the sheep and the oxen, the best of the things they could, uh, that sh should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to God. And then he said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Jump down to 24. After he says all this to Saul, then Saul says, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your works because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. The truth came out. He was fronting. Trying to act like sometimes people will lie and keep lying until they, because they're hoping you will believe the lie. I did do it. I did do it. And he called and called and called. And I said, yeah, I did. Because I feared the people. His self-image followed him and shortened his assignment. His self-image haunted him. He did not embrace being a misfit. He kept trying to fit. He kept trying to seem like something he wasn't. And so his purpose was not fulfilled in the way that God ordained it to be. You can be in purpose and still be in rebellion. You can sabotage your purpose. If you don't accept who God has called you to be, you will keep perverting your purpose to try to make it work with your insecurities. God is calling you now and saying, don't just give me a yes, but after you give me a yes, do it like I told you to do it. Stop trying to compromise it and twist it and make it fit with who you want to be. It is time for you to be who God has called you to be. That is the only way you will be effective. I said this before. The moment you try to be somebody else is a moment you will be ineffective. You will no longer be effective if you are not true to who God has called you to be. He has made you to fit a purpose the way he has made you to fit it. Yeah. 
Stop trying to alter his purpose for your comfort. Alter his purpose for people's acceptance. Alter his purpose for your monetary gain. Alter his purpose so that you don't have to sacrifice anything. Alter his purpose so you don't have to be stretched out of your comfort zone. Alter his purpose so you don't have to give up anything. God is saying, this is what I've called you to do. This is how I've called you to do it. And if you do this, your legacy will live. It is not God's will when you're in purpose, that you don't have a legacy to leave behind. That's right, that's right. There will always be legacy tied to your purpose. Right. But many of us don't have anything to leave behind, not just monetarily, but spiritually, yeah. mentally, knowledge, experience. Many of us don't have anything to leave behind because we don't want to do it God's way. Yeah. And we end up aborting our babies, aborting the legacy prematurely that is not the will of God and I'm done follow the example of Jesus Jesus was constantly being challenged and he is constantly being rejected but he never yielded he never sacrificed his assignment for the acceptance of people never in John chapter 7, his brothers were, you know, trying to tease him. And they were like, if you, if you must do all of this, you know, no one does all this and acts like you act in hides. You know, well, go, go on down there to show yourself to the people. They were like, make it known openly. And Jesus said, my time has not yet come. But. Then he threw a little jab at him. He said, but your time is always ready. And you're like, um, you know, I have a purpose on my life. I have a specific thing God's created me to do. So there's a specific timing to everything I do. There's a reason for everything I do. But see, you're not in purpose, so you can do whatever you want. You don't understand. I dare somebody. <laughs> To be able to take the approach of Jesus and not be offended, but recognize that people who don't understand purpose will never get your purpose. That's right. That's right. They will never get why you do what you do. And matter of fact, you don't even have to get me, but you have to respect it. And Jesus was like, you may not understand, but don't insult me. And so Jesus was never rushed. He, he never cared. Oh, they're doing this over here. They're doing that over there. I must hurry up and go so I can be seen. Because his goal wasn't to be seen. It was to fulfill the assignment of the father. Because he was secure. Saul was insecure. His goal was to be seen and accepted and respected because he did not see himself that way. So he was moving impulsively. He was moving to please the people. Jesus didn't care about pleasing the people. He just wanted to please God. So he was himself, the fullness of who he's called to be. Even when they tried to walk him off a cliff, the crowd came around him, edging him to a cliff. He didn't say, okay, okay. He cut on through. Because his time had not yet come. He was confident even in the face of opposition because he knew that there was a timing and an assignment on his life. Can you be confident in the face of opposition, of rejection, of misunderstandings? Because you say it's a timing thing. Some of you, here's the word of the Lord for you. If you can endure being misunderstood... God will prosper you in the due time that he has for you. When you try to avoid being misunderstood, you move prematurely and you miss his divine promotion. You promote yourself, which is short-lived. When God promotes, he establishes, which means he now firmly fixed me in a place. Because he does it. 
But do I, am I willing to be misunderstood? Am I willing to go first? Am I willing to follow the spirit of God and do what he's called me to do when no one else is doing it? Be who he's called me to be when I don't see anybody else doing it. When no one has a blueprint, no one has a path, no one has a plan that I can follow. Can you be a trailblazer? Because, see, I see a lot of people talking about being trailblazers, but they not. They looking like everybody else. A trailblazer is unique. A trailblazer literally creates a path. And when you're called to create a path, you have to work harder. And you have to go down a path that is unknown, that is rougher. But when God has assigned you to that, he put it in you to be able to endure it. So, Father, we ask that you would give us the courage and the faith to be who you have created us to be. I pray right now that you would give your children new eyes, new eyes, new eyes. That they would no longer see themselves as nothing. I bind the spirit of false humility. That religious humility. That thinks downing and trashing yourself glorifies God. But I thank you, Lord, that we will exchange it for a pure humility. Pure humility is when we acknowledge that we are nothing without God, but we're still something because of him. We're something through Christ, not in our own doing. To disrespect ourselves is to disrespect the sacrifice. To think we're trash is to disregard the power of Christ. Father, give us a holy humility. That doesn't strip away our confidence in you. That doesn't allow us to sabotage ourselves. Because of our insecurities. I thank you, Lord, that you're healing your children even now from childhood wounds. Verbal abuse. Parents, people who have torn them down. Teachers who have told them that they wouldn't be successful. People who have told them that they weren't smart. People who have devalued them. People who have rejected them. People who have abandoned them. I pray right now, Lord, that you begin to heal the child. The child that keeps jumping up every time you have called them to an assignment. The child that keeps interfering every time you have told them who they are in you. The child that reminds them of the negativity. Heal on today, God. The child that sabotages relationships. The child that sabotages God-given opportunities. Because they still see themselves as the least of the least. Let your spirit speak now, oh God. Let your spirit speak loudly. Let your spirit speak strongly. And I declare that as your word goes forth and as your truth goes forth, it shall make them free. In the mighty name of Jesus, we break and we sever every bind of the childhood abuse and childhood abandonment. And we sever every generational curse of sabotage, of, of poverty, of, of, of confusion, of quitting, of fear, of torment. We sever it right now and we declare that every generational curse that has tried to attach itself to them, to their future, right now has no power and no authority. We cancel the contract with darkness, even the ones they made verbally as they spoke negativity over themselves and they spoke curses over themselves and they downed themselves and they verbally abused themselves and they tore themselves down. I Right now, I stand in the gap and I intercede and I cast down every word that they cursed themselves with. We plead the blood of Jesus and we bask them in the blood of Jesus. May it make them new. May it cleanse them right now from the old man. God reveal it to them 
Reveal it to them. Let it no longer lie dormant. May it no longer be hidden. But reveal it. Reveal every part of it. Reveal it. Reveal the secret voices. Reveal the procrastination. Reveal the fear. Huh? Reveal the rejection. Reveal it. Huh? Reveal the wounds. Huh? Reveal it right now. Reveal the brokenness right now in the name of Jesus. And we declare, Lord, you're giving them new language. New language. New language. I hear God saying, some of you speak a certain way because that's all you've ever heard but God said he's giving you new language you do not have to repeat what you've always heard you don't have to do things because it's always been done that way I declare even the way you talk to your children is gonna change the way you talk to yourself is going to change new language new language he is breaking off that old language that negativity that complaining that that victimized language he's shifting he's shifting your tongue he's shifting your tongue the enemy has been using your tongue as a weapon against you and a weapon against your future but he says now he is shifting your tongue to be a weapon against hell the thing you were giving permission to you will now be killing yourself that way he said don't talk about my child don't talk to my child that way when your language to yourself changes the language that you allow will change you will stop letting people talk to you crazy when you stop talking to yourself crazy the bible says faith come by hearing Some of you have no, have the faith in the wrong direction because you keep speaking those things to yourself and you're hearing what you're saying. True hearing comes from the word of God. And when it talks about, the Bible talks about hearing, it's talking about an ability to fully understand spiritually. But then we have a natural hearing that still manifests as we speak, we hear ourselves. And it doesn't birth the faith that is in God. It birth the faith that is in whatever it is we're saying. Faith isn't just faith in God. Faith is a persuasion in whatever direction. We want it to be in God. But some of you have more faith in what you're going to fail at than what God can do. You have more faith in the kingdom of darkness than in the kingdom of light. My, my, my. We know what we have faith in by what we fear. When we have paralyzing fear of the enemy, it's because we have more faith in him. When we have faith in God, we fear him with a reverence. But when I have faith in the enemy, I fear him. And it births faith in me, and I believe that he's more powerful than God. I have more faith that I'm going to fail at this than I'm going to succeed. God wants to turn the dial of your faith. Because you got faith. You got too much in the wrong place. He said, turn the dial. Turn, turn the dial. toward heaven you got to believe bigger in what God can do than what you can't 
some of you believe in what you can't more than what God can. That's why we get stuck. What is your belief in? What is your belief in? Saul believed so much in the people that he disobeyed God. Father, direct our faith to the right place. That we may obey you, live a life that's pleasing to you, not fearing to fail. Not fearing failing. Not fearing failing. Not fearing failing. Not fearing failing. I feel that heavy in here. Not fearing failing. Not fear of failing. You fear failing because you've given too much weight to the approval of people. I have this saying, I don't live to prove people wrong. I live to prove God right. Why are you still trying to prove people wrong? What's going to happen when you do? What's going to change? Nothing. But I just want to prove God right, that him choosing me was right. Him calling me was right. God, you didn't make a mistake when you called me. God, because I'm going to do everything you call me to do. I'm going to be pleasing to you. I want to prove that you were right. You chose right. Change your focus. Change your focus. Whatever you focus on, you magnify. And whatever you magnify, that's the direction you're going in. So if you are focused on people, you will magnify people and you will always be inclined to please them. That's what Saul did. Jesus always focused on the Father. No matter what people say, my meat is to do the will of the Father. My job is to please the Father. My job is to complete this assignment. His focus was God. He magnified God. He went towards God. He lived to please God. I get this question all the time and I'm done. People say, how do I, how do I live a life that's pleasing to God? How do I do what God wants me to do? Look at him. It's not deep. Look at him. Peter was walking on water until he took his eyes off of him. The Bible said, and then he saw the wind and the waves. You can't see wind. You can see the effect of it. He became aware of it. When you become too aware, aware of what's around you more than you are who you're going towards, you sink. You want to look like God? You want to do, please God? Look at him. Focus on him. Stop obsessing over, oh, this person's doing it. Oh, this person's doing that. Oh, this person's doing that. How much time are you spending looking at God and finding out what he wants you to do? Are you looking and obsessing over what everyone else is doing? And the more you look at them, the smaller you feel. But the thing about looking at God is, the more I look at him, the more secure I feel. The more I realize how big he is and how much he is capable of keeping me. And the less afraid I feel. Because he's a big God. And if he called me, he will keep me. Father, we bless you. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. Come on, praise God for that word. Hallelujah. That was a right now word, an on-time word for each and every one of us. Not only with what we're going through and what we're, with what we're experiencing, but also with helping us to remain obedient to the word of God. No matter what happens, obedience is best. 
No matter what occurs or what people say, no matter what it looks like, obedience is best. It's the obedience that will lead me into my wealthy place. And we declare that over each and every one of your lives in the name of Jesus. You don't have to worry about how things look while you're following God. Just know that in you following God and being obedient to his assignment for your life, that God will prosper you over man. Amen? Amen. Listen, we've got a few invitations for you. We thank you for your time and being with us here today. Um, after receiving the word of faith, after hearing what God has assigned for your life, if you've not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, but you're making that decision and that claim on today that he is Lord over my life, this is what I want you to do. If you're on Facebook Live, what I want you to do is right there in the chat, I want you to say, I receive. But if you're here with us present today and you're receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, what I want you to do is I want you to be bold and raise your hand in this place just so we can identify who the new family of Christ is. And so if you're in the chat, just type, I receive. We've got intercessors and we've got elders and ministers in the faith who are waiting and excited to pray over you, to acknowledge you, to welcome you to the ecclesia, the universal body of Christ. We've got one more invitation. If you are uh, outside of your relationship with God, for whatever reason, you've decided that you can take your purpose into your own hands, just as prophet has declared on today. And for whatever circumstance, you decided to withdraw yourself from relationship with God. But you say, you know what? After today, I realize that I can do it better with God, that my life will be better because of God, that the outcome of everything Thing that I've gone through will be much more pleasing if I do it in the confines of his will. That my purpose means nothing without him. Then what I want you to do is real simple. If that's you, I want you to type, I'm coming home. And that's just simply saying that I'm coming back home to the body of Christ. I'm coming back home to my relationship with God. And if you're in this place, and if that is for you, if you can also raise your hand, hallelujah, come on, come on, do it, do it, do it. Come on, you can do better than that. 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 Act like you love her. Act like you love her. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, act like you know what God did for you when you were in that situation. Come on, come on, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. Hallelujah, we're throwing a party right now. Amen, because the devil is defeated and God is glorified. And we declare victory over your life in Jesus' name. This is a new day and a new beginning. Hallelujah. Behold the, behold, the old things are gone. And God restore and make new and bring wholeness in the name of Jesus. As well, if you're in the chat and you've made a decision of faith to come back to the fold of Christ, we celebrate you. Those cheers are for you as well. We're excited about your decision today. After receiving the word, knowing that I can only do what I do because of him and because of who he is and how big he is and how powerful he is. And we're thankful to God for your decision. And we want to pray with you real quick. Father, we just thank you for the love that you have shed abroad in the hearts of your people. We thank you, God, that you have made their, them alive. You have awakened them to your spirit. You have awakened them to purpose and to destiny. You have awakened them to the benefits that you daily give us, Father. I thank you, God, for your hand of protection. I thank you for the fresh start that is going to happen in the, in the lives of your people. I thank you, God, for the provision and the overflow of love, God. I thank you father for the comfort and the healing the joy the restoration i thank you for deliverance for salvation that is coming to every believer every heart that is open to receive you i thank you father for the cleansing of every sin by the blood of jesus christ i thank you god that we don't have to walk in fear of penalty of what was done in the past but you not only died for what we did but you also died for the penalty of it god i thank you for your mercy I thank you for your grace and your truth. And we rejoice with those who are rejoicing in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Come on one more time. Put your hands together. Hallelujah. We are excited. Amen. For the devil is surely defeated and God be glorified in Jesus name. 
Amen. You all make sure you greet her. Amen. And celebrate with her as we exit the facility on today. Hallelujah. Amen. What a day of rejoicing. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is a victory celebration. Yeah, the enemy thought he won. <laughs> but I laugh in the face of the enemy. <laughs> he thought he had you, yeah, but God be glorified. Amen. Praise God. Listen, we've got one more invitation. If you do not have a church home or if you've been looking for a church home and you're considering making Liberate, Liberate Church your place of worship, we want to formally welcome you to Liberate Church and tell you all you've got to do, real simple, if you're here today, we've got some new membership forms out in the foyer. You can fill those out and turn those into the offering receptacle that's on the wall or you can go online, which is really the easiest method, on the website, which is www.liberatedallas.com on the membership uh, on the right hand side of the screen is a membership you click on that fill out the information and our elders will be in contact with you we have elders who are assigned to each and every member who contact you not to be in your business but just to make sure you are right and to pray over you regular, regularly and to know that you have a body of believers who are here with you, being steadfast with you, especially in times like these where we're not able to be as close as we want to be or fellowship as frequently. We have individuals who have been assigned to you to make sure that you remain connected. Amen? Amen. So if that's you, just go ahead and go to the website, fill that information out, and you'll be contacted shortly. If that's all we've got, we'll stand and have our benediction, and you will be dismissed. Amen. What a word. What a word. What a word. Amen. I thank God for the gift of prophetess in this place. So, Father, we bless your name and we honor you. Truly, you're worthy of all of the worship. And so, we magnify you in our lives. Above everything else, Father, we see you on the throne of our heart where you belong. Because our bodies are vessels, Lord, to be pleasing unto you. So, we submit them as living sacrifice, saying, Lord, have your way. We declare that we desire not only your purpose, but your will to be fulfilled in our life. And we do it through the avenue of obedience. We thank you, God, that you have not given up on us, but you've given us through grace and mercy another chance to be pleasing in your sight. So we desire to please you, oh God, and we sacrifice before you because we know you'll make our lives better. In all the ways that we sacrifice to everything else, Father, we turn away from them and we run unto you because we know that in your name you'll hide us and protect us and shelter us and keep us. So regardless of what man may have to say, we run into the left of the rock, God. We know that you'll cover us and keep us. And so we pray, Father God, that you'll lavish us with your benefit as we show into you, Lord, and as your word inculcates itself through our lives. Make us fruitful, O oh God, and plentiful. And as you're pruning us, let us know that it's not us losing, but we're about to gain. We're in a gaining season. When you prune it off, I know things are about to return bigger. And so I declare multiplicity over the lives of your people. And as it was sung today, Father God, we declare over their generations because of their obedience their generations will be blessed because of their obedience the legacy will be lengthened and we thank you for it now now send your angels before us to prosper us on our way and to keep us from all hurt harm danger death and even destruction and we'll glorify you through it all for it is in the name of Jesus we declare we say thank God and amen hallelujah you are dismissed and let me tell you, happy Thanksgiving right now. We won't see you throughout the week, but I pray that God bless and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.